And what about secondary hypertension? When do you see that? I think a secondary hypertension, it's, it's rare. It's only up to 10% of cases of hypertension. It's probably less than that. Um, but especially in a middle-aged adult, when they come in with a very high blood pressure, and particularly a blood pressure that's not well controlled on initial therapy, you can consider some differential diagnosis. Thyroid disease is very easy to test for and pretty common. But oftentimes it will also be associated with other symptoms and a pulse if they're hyperthyroid that's high. So therefore, uh, you can ferret out that they have thyroid disease from, from other historical factors. It's rare when it's just sitting there um, and the only symptom it's really you know, causing is high blood pressure. Hyperaldosteronism can be a problem, Con syndrome. Um, so look for electrolyte abnormalities associated with that. Renal artery stenosis is the most common cause of secondary hypertension. And if it's middle-aged adults, you're probably talking about acquired renal artery uh, stenosis as opposed to congenital renal artery stenosis. This, you know, watch what their, um, their uh, GFR, their glomerular filtration rate is doing, watch their creatinine levels, uh, but it often needs um, analysis with something like either a CT or magnetic resonance uh, angiography of the renal arteries. And pheochromocytoma, we all worry about it. It's actually incredibly rare. And again, these patients usually have other symptoms, tremor, uh, sweating, and weight loss uh, that can give away the fact that they have this excess of catecholamines. It's rare that it's just, oh, the blood pressure is, um, is elevated by itself. What do you do to evaluate patients once they are diagnosed with hypertension? Everybody gets a baseline electrocardiogram, looking for things like left ventricular hypertrophy or prior cardiac damage, a glucose level or an HbA1c, something to screen for diabetes, something to screen for hyperlipidemia, um, a check of their electrolytes along with their kidney function as well as a hemoglobin level, and urinalysis or a microalbumin creatinine ratio to check for the possibility of proteinuria and early kidney disease. That's your baseline. And these essentially should re be repeated at least when we talk about um, the, the electrolytes, the urinalysis um, on an annual basis. A at least, at least an annual basis. Remember that lifestyle changes are still at the foundation for the treatment of hypertension. And actually, if you look at something like the uh, dietary approaches to stop hypertension, that, that reduction on average with uh, 11 and a half over five and a half points uh, of mercury is really remarkable. That's more powerful than most antihypertensive agents. And obviously patients can do it with DASH. That's gonna yield other good things in terms of their cholesterol and their metabolism, their body weight. Um, so there's side benefits to that diet that are really wonderful, but you know, that, that reduction in blood pressure values is, is outstanding. Weight loss um, certainly promotes um, uh, lower blood pressure as well. So that's one of the benefits of, say, bariatric surgery. A lot of uh, patients are cured of hypertension uh, following uh, the significant weight loss they experience with bariatric surgery. But even following a good diet and exercise and losing four kilos uh, can result in a significant reduction in blood pressure. And exercise, as I mentioned, in and of itself can reduce blood pressure as well. So uh, these are the keys. And uh, you can see that if you put all these things together, uh, many patients wouldn't, you know, could avoid uh, medical therapy completely if they really embraced uh, diet and exercise. So let's return to our case. Um, she's actually come back to clinic now, and her repeat blood pressure, un unfortunately, despite trying to do her lifestyle changes in the past two weeks, is 150 over 94. Her pulse is 86 beats per minute. So now what do you want to do? Do you want to allow six months for her lifestyle changes to have an effect since she started them? Do you want to start a thiazide diuretic, start an alpha adrenergic blocker, or start a beta blocker? Which one would you choose? I would go with a thiazide diuretic. That is recommended as a first-line therapy by JNC8. So here are the first-line treatments after lifestyle for hypertension. Um, can be a th and JNC8 left this fairly open. Um, and again, these are only recommendations, but the recommendations are broad and catch most patients, I think. Thiazide diuretics are a great, uh, alter, a great option for patients. One thing whenever I prescribe a diuretic um, is that I will ask them if they have any urinary issues. Um, many older adults have overactive bladder or benign prostatic hypertrophy, and therefore already uh, may be struggling uh, with uh, genital urinary issues. I don't want to exacerbate that by giving them a thiazide diuretic. I would choose something else for those patients. 
The other thing is prescribing a thiazide alone, watch closely for the potassium because thiazide pr uh, promotes hypokalemia. Whereas ACE inhibitors and ARBs, also considered a first-line uh, agent, uh, can promote hyperkalemia. So therefore, the, uh, a combination of one of those agents with a thiazide is helpful um, in terms of maintaining normal kalemia. And calcium channel blockers have their own range of side effects, but one thing they don't do uh, much is affect electrolytes. It's also worth noting that atenolol is not recommended by JNC8. It doesn't confer overall the same mortality benefit for cardiovascular disease that these other agents maintain. <music>